You're listening to The Unstoppable Podcast, the go-to place for everyone to learn about the latest innovations in Web3, NFTs, and the decentralized web. Welcome to the Metaverse. GMGM, GM, welcome to The Unstoppable Podcast. My name is Josh Gordon. Today, we're going to be talking about music NFTs, Web3 culture with Jeremy Fall. Jeremy, how you doing? Thanks for joining the pod. I'm good, man. Thank you. How are you? I'm stoked today. I'm good. I love talking about music. I uh, have a little bit of a music background myself. So I think anytime we can chat about Web3 music, the state of what's going on, uh, it's exciting. I feel like the artists are really pushing a lot of you know experiments in the space, especially during this bear market we're in. You know, Web3 musicians, they're still making music, still putting out music NFTs and like trying new trying new ways to incentivize collection and really drop. So I think that's I think that's fun. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's uh, let's just start off here on the top. Can you walk us through how you got into Web3 and why you're passionate about this Web3 music space to begin with? Absolutely. So, so my background is actually as a chef and restaurateur. I had a group of uh, 14 restaurants uh, across the country that were acquired in, in 2019. And oh. so, um, you know, just like, just like everyone in the middle of the pandemic, you know, I was really just exploring things online, living online. And I, I discovered these communities through Twitter um, in the Web3 space and NFT projects as a whole. And it reminded me a lot about the food space because, like, my my strength was always, you know, creating conversations and bringing people together through food. And I was like, oh, this is very similar to what I'm seeing in these communities. The the only difference is, and the major advantage is that I'm not, you know, constrained to the four walls of a restaurant. When I bring people together, I can touch people all over the world, and, and there's a way to to do this in a much more, um, you know, meaningful way in terms of like the the capabilities of what a digital asset can do right yeah and from there so i decided to i was more of a fan of the space than a creator in the space for about a year i would say just really consuming um you know consuming the space and, and whatnot being a being a part of it and then i realized that it needed there were there were a few gaps to fill in the, in the market and it, it needed a little bit more of you know traditional uh companies coming in brands you know if we ever were to grow and and gain any sort of mass adoption there need to be other players that would come in and help diversify the ecosystem for it to really be healthy so you know we brought in brands like warner records right which led to your question which is you know we own a, a record label in partnership with warner records called probably a label and it's a, a label that we co-own with them and you know that was one of the things you know we saw that the market had a really amazing music NFTs and, and projects. But our whole thing was, you know, we're, we don't want to redefine how people listen to music. We want to help create ancillary revenue streams for artists, but more so than anything, create bigger connections between artists and, and communities. And instead of looking at it as like, this is a different way to drop music, this is just a different kind of, um, of medium for artists for musicians in this scenario to explore so yep. you have merch yep. you have shows you have all that stuff and you know nfts or digital collectibles whatever you want to call them would be a new a new medium and then from there we can help uh, guide artists that way yeah i think what you said just a second ago about being in the restaurant you know you you are restrained by those four walls and thinking through with NFTs, how you can have all these unique touch points. I mean, I, I'd be kind of curious to talk through a little bit how you can bring the physical to the and the digital, you know, together. But um, I definitely like how you're thinking there. We're going to dive into the record label in a bit. I actually want to start maybe with some food related talk, uh, since you brought up the the restaurant background. So you you did say that the restaurant, there was a difference in terms of you had this physical environment, maybe when they leave the restaurant, you can't really touch those people and impact them. But what do NFTs and food have in common, you know, besides the uh, the physical and digital restraints that are in place? What do NFTs and food have in common? Yeah. I mean, I would say Discord is like Yelp. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a bunch of people fucking complaining. They have no idea what the fuck they're talking about. That's their starters. Um, I would say that... You know, the, the the really cool thing I like about and I have a Twitter space now called Dinner Party that I have, 
which you know mimics the conversations you'd have at a dinner party just random shit people connecting it's really nice it's a really nice pleasant environment you know floor prices don't come up and um you know tech support doesn't come up with things like it's really just getting people to to uh, have their personalities come out and, and share things and it's, it's it's really nice and we do them every week right now but I would say the biggest thing about food, you now food's a component of culture, NFTs and art are a component of culture, right? Those have always been synonymous. They're, they're both creative. Um, so I think in that aspect, you know, that's the biggest thing they have in common. They bring people together, like I said before. I think that that's, those are two important things. I mean, you know, what, if you're looking at food as a, as a medium of survival and fuel, you're not going to see what I'm talking about. But if you look at it as something that you consume, if you look at, you know, chefs as creatives or artists, if you look at restaurants as you know, as creative, which they are, um, then I would say that like, yes, there's a lot of similarities. Mm. The thinking about food as culture, I mean, I guess does, have you seen food really shift with like the times? Cause I think that just in the last, I don't know, maybe 12 months, we've seen so many different phases in NFTs. So culture is definitely shifting pretty rapidly, right? P as people are experimenting. Um, would you say that food shifts as fast or is just the NFT space going to be like light speed, light speed ahead of those cultural shifts you might see in that physical environment? That's a great question. I mean, you know, I saw, I saw the food space. Like when I saw, so when I started in the hospitality, I was 11, I was a bus boy. Right. Mm. And I'm 32 now. So that was tw Jesus. That was 21 years ago. Um, but you know, when I, I was, when I was working in that sort of thing, like I, I later on, I dropped out of college, you know, hospitality was something was a low barrier of entry. My mother managed a cafe growing up. So it was a little bit of my blood too. Um, I, I really saw the industry shift from that into the celebrity chef, right? There was a little bit of the celebrity chef growing up. It was like, I kept on my hands. It was like Emerald and like, you know, that, that whole food network crowd, but it was, it started that way. Um, you know, Shep Gordon came in and started making chefs as, as celebrities and rock stars, uh, which worked when you started seeing their faces and on cookbooks and season, seasonings and stuff, right? But that still hadn't really garnered the level of reach that it has now, right? That was still very much secluded for like having a restaurant, a theme park, these very big flagship things, right? You didn't have these like underground pop-ups. You didn't have the food truck hadn't come in yet. Like, I mean, it had, but not like in like a cool way. Like it was really still, really still divided, right? There wasn't really this mix of like, of the high and the low in food, just like what happened in fashion with like bigger designers collaborating with like streetwear brands and stuff, right? Yeah. We saw that same thing happen with food where those you know, chefs that had Michelin stars started doing like underground pop-ups using, you know, Ritz crackers mixed with foie gras, whatever it is, right? You started to see that, right? And that came as I grew in the industry, right? Like when I first started, it was like there was, there, first of all, there weren't as many restaurants, right? It wasn't, it, it, you, they weren't as culturally diverse. It was really much everyone had their own cuisine. You know, again, like Emil as an example is like Cajun. And it's like you stayed in your lane or whatever it was. Then it became this melting pot. Everyone started doing these things. People were starting hosting pop-ups. Delivery came in so that like helped a little bit of like people being able to to do cheaper concepts or just deliver. So I saw that really grow. And then mainly, you know, the food became very synonymous to entertainment. And being someone who grew up in LA, um you know, I saw that very heavily here, like chefs being on TV and then books and merch and products and collaborations. And like that, there, there was really that renaissance for food. Um, so to your question, I, I see a lot of similarities with Web3. I really do. It's, it's doing the same kind of cycles. Like in the beginning, it's very much, you know, it, it's just sort of underground. And then there's going to become some like legacy people. I don't think we've even hit that mainstream celebrity chef example like i was saying with emerald yeah i think there's going to be that point um there are people that are like on the mainstream known for nfts like if you look at like gary v for example but i think we're gonna get more of that and then there's gonna be some sort of of um of boom with that aspect artists all these people like the beeples will become like very much known in the mainstream as they are and everything and then like it'll go from there totally yeah we we definitely have projects maybe more so that have made that cultural mainstream narrative versus people um but 
I, I think it's coming as well. And and Gary, obviously, you know, his, he's a big name in the space, but also just comes from, you know, the Web2 background. So maybe he's not even a true Web3 name I- itself. So one more food question, and then we will dive into probably nothing. But if someone wants to get into or learn more about Web3 or NFTs, what appetizer are you feeding them? Could be... <laughs> wait, wait, what the fuck? Yeah, like what appetizer? I, I, I'm considering an appetizer. Like are you going educational material? Are you going to give someone an appetizer, like gift them an NFT or help them open a wallet? Like what's that first touch point when they're sitting down at the uh, Web3 table to eat? So, okay. So if I were... So if, if I was trying to make someone eat, like getting them to like almost like... an acquired taste is what you're saying right someone yeah. to but they've never eaten before oh they've never eaten this type of cuisine before right like it's got to be sure okay like a palatable nft is what you're saying i just like see, when you're getting someone into web3 i don't know I, I consider an appetizer maybe you'd look at it differently like uh you're you're kind of feeling the place out you're you're hungry you're interested but uh you're your entree is still coming. Like when my friend comes to me and they're asking me about NFTs, I'm never telling them to buy, you know, like a mutant ape or to go buy like five ETH. I'm just telling them to dip their toes in. So what is, what's your your appetizer, your dipping the toes into this space kind of recommendation to someone? That's a good question. So you know what? Actually, I would have to say that it would have to be something frictionless, right? Either a PO app or... You know, I don't use a lot of things on Flow, but like that could be one of them. It would have to be frictionless because, and it would have to be something that relates to a, a brand or something that they know, right? It has to be familiar to them, right? It's like as if you're going to have someone try, you know, truffle aioli for the first time, you have to make sure like they've liked aioli before, right? It's like, it's those kinds of things, right? So that's a really fucking hard one, man. Like I, you know, I, I don't, I try not to be, thinking within our own projects but when i think of like our probably label nft not being biased but i am being biased you know it's a it's a project with warner records right like it's a it's a quantity that's high enough for the like the entry point financially is not a million dollars um and you know it delivers utility as in like free music like our first drop was with diddy and jason martin and hit boy and like these are artists are familiar with people these are things people know warner they know those artists we can tell them that hey you have access to music you have access to resources for the label i think that actually is a good one i think that that would be a good example I'm trying to think of a project that's not you know ours um is a is a bit difficult that's okay no you know, that's you know what actually top nba top shot might be a good example for someone because you can get like a five dollar NBA NFT and it's pretty frictionless. I would say that's probably a good one too. Totally, yeah. I I actually haven't recommended NBA Top Shot to someone in a while, even though that's what I used to recommend. But totally, that is a great frictionless uh, platform and project to dive into, especially if you're a sports fan. But I like how you called out frictionless specifically. I'm thinking so much about the user experience someone goes through, and it can't feel like a crypto native experience for a lot of people to really get interested that that works for some people but uh maybe for the the novice that that's not going to feel comfortable so you know uh other another one i might think of is gifting people an nft maybe a music one since we're familiar with collection of music i also think of web3 domain names whether it's an unstoppable and domain maybe it's an ens could be both so you kind of show them the differences one can be more frictionless with unstoppable like you pay you can pay with a credit card and then you can go through that same experience with them on ens and then go pay with crypto so it could be a double-edged sword to kind of learn on but uh appreciate that take well i mean you brought up probably uh probably a label i mean let's dive into everything probably nothing now and go deeper there so what are you really trying to accomplish with this is it to is it to bring new artists into the space is it to show you know the people that web3 can be used as another creative channel um like to hear what you're really trying to accomplish yeah i mean so the way the best way for me to describe probably nothing is the way supreme in the early 90s um you know represented skate culture 
And it was a very, 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 very small subset of people at the time before like it really became like mainstream and whatnot. They represented skate culture and they grew with that culture. They didn't go ahead and try to like appeal to everybody right off the bat and go to they really stuck to their guns and grew slowly and scaled for the long term. Right? That so the brand is inspired by that that same kind of ethos and also the fact that people didn't believe, you know, our whole slogan is believers of the internet, right? So people didn't believe in the internet the late 90s, early 2000s, right? And it's the same thing with, with Web3 now. So we took inspiration from that, um, from both those things. I'm actually born in 1990, so so those things are both very big in my in my childhood. And um, growing up around in Los Angeles around skate culture and whatnot, like I also saw a lot of that, right? I saw that, that growth. And I think that that's what Supreme, and that's what Thrasher, those, that's what those brands really did the best, is they just... Re- continue to represent the culture through and through and they still do today right even at the level that they are they still do and i think that's why there's still such a cult following that's why people still line up because it still feels very much native to that to that demographic yeah and you're talking about culture a lot and i feel like that's a word that maybe some people get some people don't um and i feel like you talk about what your inspiration is and i'm seeing it at, from the outside you know before talking to you today seeing it as a little bit of a mixture between music and art and then there's this technology component does does that representation of web3 culture is that in line with how you feel it's being represented by the media or you know by the mainstream no it's it's really you know it, it i think the way the mainstream represented represents it is is not you know, and I can't speak for every single article out there, but for the sure. most part, it's just not, not valid, not accurate. You know, it's a, it's a part, it's a biased approach to the space, right? It's, you know, it's talking about skateboarding accidents more than it is talking about, you know, skateboard culture, or skateboard tricks or successful sides. It's like, that's the same way I look at it. It's like, if and I've never, I'm going to use that analogy again. I've never used that before, but it's, it's just like, they just talk about like the negatives and I, I use this example for, but like, remember how fucking scary email was? People were like, no emails, no chat rooms, nothing. It was like, I remember my mother growing up. It was like, if I turn on the computer, I was going to get kidnapped and murdered. Right. It's like, that's just how it was. Cause we didn't know. And if you look at those media headlines back then, it was the same thing. There's like an article in Newsweek. I think it's from 1994, 95. That says the internet will never be Nirvana. And it's like, or they call it the World Wide Web or whatever it was, but it's it's interesting to see that. So I don't think it's an accurate, you know, description. Like are th- are the things that they report factual for the most part? Yeah, of course. But there's things that happen in everything, right? Yeah, bad things, bad players everywhere. So I think for us, it's like okay, you know, when we have conversations with people, we can be like, hey, we do this like we do really dope clothing. Oh, that's cool. We have a record label with Warner. Oh, that's cool. You know, we do these like really collectible items that people own in their wallets. Oh, that's cool. You know, we can we can have a conversation about everything we do without mentioning the word NFT or crypto, right? We're a company built in the Web3 space, so that is what we are. We are native to that. That is what we, we will always be because that's how we were born. But ultimately for us, it's, you know, if you, if you make it more about the tech and the ability to bring people together through that, through blockchain technology and whatnot, and, you know, we're not, we're not the project that focuses on the flippers and that's it there are projects that do that i have nothing nothing against that that's just not our thing like we want to deliver utility and we want to create value for people long term short term you know we want to give people the ability to do things they couldn't do before and like inspire ideas and whatnot and that's why i think we have a really solid following because the the epitome of a flipper is a short-term relationship you have with your holder it's short term that's why it's called a flipper right yeah. we're not interested in the short term we're here for the long term so you know, I don't want to. Ch- I don't want our fan base to rotate between like two thousand people that change all the you know every day. Totally. When you think about that, that culture is. Um, you were talking about how you really try not to use the word even NFT or Web three, and maybe that's just when you're talking to other brands or you know business partners. But is the aspect of ownership part of what you think makes this culture so interesting? Just people actually owning digital goods, digital assets and property versus this more like passive consumption or viewership of them that we've previously had on the internet. 
Yeah. I, and no, of course, that, that that's the biggest thing is like there is this sense of ownership where everyone wins, right? And I get that there's a financial motivation in that. You know, it is, look, I have, I have pairs of sneakers that I paid 175, 200 bucks for that are worth thousands of dollars now. It's awesome that I have those. I'm not going to sell them ever. It's not because that's not what I do, right? It is cool to see that there's, that I own something that's like unique that people want and like that not everyone has. Like everyone feels like a certain level of being of like special in that, in that sense, right? So I get it. Where I think it becomes toxic is where, that is the priority. And if you don't make life changing money every time you flip, it's a scam, right? And that's mm. where the, the toxicity comes in with a lot of the space is like, you know, people buying projects that they know nothing about because they think it's going to make money. And when it doesn't make them money that they want, it turns into a scam. And then that I am someone who was in the public eye before Web3. So I have. I have gone through all the mental health challenges and I still do, but like I went through them in the, in the beginning of being public and having to deal with that and whatnot. So I've like have grown a thicker skin over the years. Right. But there's a lot of people that are new to this and it's, it's very serious. I think that people there's, there's such a lack of context in the space for everything. Like a comment is a comment and it's worth a thousand million words to people because it, it has the people are trying to cancel each other left and right and it's very toxic and and there's just such a motivation of money and greed that it causes anger but that's very very serious and dangerous right and we're just not interested in partaking in that whatsoever totally yeah I've, i mean i you mentioned earlier even saying it sounds like you have a big disdain for like yelp and discord just because these comments can come in i mean personally I'm a Yelp fan, but I'm not on the restaurant side of things. I'm just from a, a customer. But I can totally see how that can really get to a lot of builders in the space, even when people have expectations that aren't in line with necessarily what you're trying to put out. Um, and maybe one more common question to you about culture here is I was thinking about just that word more. And I feel like from a technology perspective, perspective like blockchain and web3 it has it has this big culture talk but other technologies don't like ai doesn't have culture i mean i don't know if climate tech has culture or what else and what else is out there but why do you think it is like what is it about like blockchain crypto specifically that has this whole like cultural movement behind it outside of just the technology development it's a good question. I mean, if in terms of AI, I would argue that that could change tomorrow if Travis Scott decided to generate his new album art with AI or whatever it was, right? Like, all of a sudden, AI becomes like a big part of like modern culture, and then people are like talking about it, and then there's like a show that adopts it, or like you know people are using ChatGPT, like mm. you know, and it's like the first ever novel written in ChatGPT, like that. There's, that will happen probably very, very soon. Like, there's no way that that's not going to happen in the next year. I, it's going to happen. Um, my biggest, my biggest thing is like, you know, it, it's got to be a, it's got to have some sort of, for lack of a better word, like sexy, attractive element to be in that, right? So a lot of times, tech doesn't have that. Tech doesn't have a lot of times. Tech is behind the scenes. It's not the face of anything or or, or whatnot, right? Here in this scenario, blockchain tech allows, right, for a, an attractive face, an attractive, uh, there's art that can be connected to it. There's access to things, you know, like visuals, access, all those things are component of culture that already exists, right? This is just facilitating them, right? So like, if you look at, you know, a technology that, you know, is, is going to, you know, clean trash cans or like in, in, like by the ocean, like there's not anything that's really palpable to like the average person that that would be attractive for them. But here you have the ability to bring in artists and brands and big names and, and all that stuff. It has all the ingredients. Blockchain has all the ingredients for, for, for it to have gotten that, that mainstream element. Right. And that's why I think AI has that as well. So it becomes a part of culture. I mean, I was actually watching the Santa Clauses, this, that new TV show that is like the original, like Tim Allen and everything. 
and they mentioned NFTs in it. And I was like, this is fucking insane. Like I, the same movie I grew up now has this thing where, where NFTs are mentioned, right? Like, like years later. So I think that anything that can be adapted by fashion, music, entertainment, all those things can automatically have cultural relevance. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I, what you said about AI actually made me maybe think in that moment, you know, if Travis Scott were to generate an album or album artwork with it, it's really the the tangible output that we have with NFTs is visual side of things. And I think that culture really came with the NFT movement. Maybe it was there when in when crypto was really just financial. It was just tokens that we were trading like Bitcoin, ETH, Litecoin back in 2017 prior. But with AI, this is kind of the first time we have these outputs that the average person can see and make themselves before. I mean, AI was here, but it was in your Netflix recommendation algorithm. It's in your Amazon, you know, you might want to buy this to kind of pop ups and maybe it's in chat bots, but now we're seeing creative work come out and culture. It sounds like is really aligned with that creative uh, element to it. So I could totally that, see that being one of the catalysts around this movement here. Um, yeah, absolutely. And talking more about creative, I, so you mentioned Warner, you, we've talked about, uh, so there's probably nothing and it sounds like that's like the parent company and then you have probably a label and you're partnered with Warner, uh, for the, the, the NFT music work you're doing. And so I'm curious why, like, why does Warner want to have a web three arm, a web three label in the first place? That's a good question, and I don't want to answer for them, but I'll tell you what I, my opinion is. Yeah, please. So Warner has always been very much at the cultural forefront, right? I would actually say labels in general, right? But let's just say Warner's this scenario. They've adopted technology very quickly. It came with streaming music, releasing music, connecting with fans, right? Musicians, I would say out of all artists, are probably some of the most – diverse artists there are because they have visuals they have per live performance they have obviously the sonic element with the actual music they have merch with products like the clothing whatever it is right so it only makes sense that a new way to sell things drop things connect with fans distribute things would attract the music industry right and warner who i would see even more so than other um, companies have acquired interesting brands before that have helped that have really made an impact on culture and that ha have helped move um the way they look at music forward um they've, they're notorious for that so it makes sense to me that they looked at web3 them partnering with us i think was awesome because we first partnered with them even before we launched label on a project called stick Men toys which is a project it was a 5,000 pfp collection and it was warner records bose and us Right. And the Stickman Project is a band, or sorry, I should say a musical group that Warner is signed to Warner Records UK. So Stickman Toys was, was a, a spin off of that. Right. So they came to us saying, hey, this is Warner they came to us saying, hey, we have a really cool idea. We have this like NFT and it comes with an audio file for this, from this group that we manage. Sorry, not we manage, that we, that we have on the label. And I was like, that's awesome. They're like, oh yeah, and all the IP is free. We want to give this IP away for free. So that was the first thing that attracted me to them is because I was like, wow, this is a major label. Major labels have the reputation, obviously, of owning the artists and blah, 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 and like fucking over the artists or not. That is the the, the traditional um, uh, reputation that the that the stereotypical reputation I say that labels have, right? Yeah. So yeah. Here that I have a big name wanting to put their name on it, like wanting to put their name on the forefront, not like, hey, we're behind the scenes, let's see how it works. And if it's successful, we'll put our name on it. It's like, no, they're at the forefront. It's like Warner Rex, we're gonna do press around it, we're gonna do tweets, posts, spaces, everything. They were willing to really be in the community, understand and do everything. And they came to us. We didn't pitch them, they came to us because they wanted to enter the space the right way. And really make sure that they respected the space. So, so when I saw that, I was like, you know, this is a smart way of thinking, right? This is a, a corporation that obviously is massive, but they're thinking the right way. So I think for them, it's like, hey, Web3 is the future. 
they're my opinion is they're they're web three is the future is what they're thinking and they we, they want to make a bet on the future and they want to partner with people who are already doing it like us. Yeah. So, and it and it makes sense. How I mean, so if they think web three is the future, and I know um, you're kind of we're not talking on behalf of Warner right now, but as, as a partner here, like how are we thinking through NFTs helping the artist on that next level? Is it is it as a growth channel, monetization tool, artist fan connection? I mean, I know that it can be done across all of these, but is there like a specific area in that uh, artist journey that you or you and Warner are like thinking about um, really trying to tap into first? Okay, so say, can you rephrase that, please, just to make sure I answer correctly? Yeah, so I'm, I like, I guess I'm trying to figure out what NFTs really are going to mean for the artists. And as a, as a label, your, the labels are working with artists across all aspects of that artist journey, like selling, selling tickets, selling merch. Um, so monetizing off of their, off of their IP, off their music, they're Mm -hmm. responsible for helping build artist fan connections. Um, putting marketing and growth strategies in place. And I see NFTs potentially being able to do like all of that and more. But is there a element of that artist journey that probably a label and Warner are thinking about trying to tap into and grow and help out with NFTs first? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I'm very happy you said that because that's actually one of the things we're, we've, we've talked about doing is you know so our whole thing is we do obviously we do music releases right we do them Mm -hmm. with big artists and that's awesome and i love that we do that and we're going to keep doing that um what also excites me is that you know we're we're working with developing smaller artists but in a different way not just like you know here's an advance here you're going to put out this amount of album we're going to copy paste the formula and whatnot no we're working on being able to make people feel like they have an emotional you know, an ownership or connection to the artist through blockchain early on in their journey as they grow, right? So it's about being able to authenticate or digitize what you want to call it, those moments before they happen so that people, the fans can experience them with the artist, right? And they feel like they're growing with the artist. So that's definitely something. So that artist, do. that artist fan connection and relationship really getting to establish that early, it sounds like is one of the, the main focuses. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. And it's like, you know, it, it, it has to be diverse to, for it to be healthy, right? You need to have the big artists. You need to have small artists. Like, I, we're treating this as, like, artists interested in Web3, right? And that's what we're here to help. It's no matter how big or small they are, right? But even for big artists, like, there's so many things that we can do that they couldn't do before, right? And that's great because it, it does help with getting mass adoption to more users. And then that helps benefit the small artists too because now we have more people interested in music NFTs that can discover small artists and be a part of those journeys before they happen, right? That's one of those things. And like for, for me, you know, I love the idea of working with those artists that most people haven't heard of but might have two, 300,000 followers on Instagram and get 8,000 comments because they have the craziest fans, but they've never won a Grammy. They're not on the radio. They're not that. And we saw that with the SoundCloud generation, right? SoundCloud rappers, some of them have like millions of followers and like most people hadn't heard of them. Right. And then one day they get on rolling loud. It's like on the lower, you know, lower on the lineup and then they get, they blow up and then, you know, but I love that localized crazy fan base. Like that's something I'm really excited for. We're like, you know, I've been to like rap concerts where there's like, 3,000, 4,000 people and 5,000 people outside trying to get in and you may have never heard of this person, right? Because it has this like very tribal, very underground element. That's what I'm trying to capture in Web3 too is like that Twitter community that's like, here's this show happening in Bushwick or wherever it is. Come join this, like our rapper like shows up an hour after they tweet. Like I'm trying to get that into the Web3 space, getting some of those people to bring that, you know, that excitement and that investment and that interest in musicians to come into Web3. And as much as I can do to make it easy, where it's not like here's 50,000 barriers to enter Web3 for you to be a part of it, where the more we can simplify it over time and the more we can use resources of a company like Warner to help facilitate that conversation, like that's what's interesting to me. Yeah. Is there a, a, like a, a specific success metric for what 
you know, some, an artist jumping into web three looks like, is it, I mean, is it just putting out a song as an NFT? Is it a number of collectors? I mean, how would you advise an emerging artist who's interested in the space and say, Hey, you should think about doing this. And if you do like, this is where really what you should be shooting for. Another, another good question. I mean, I think it's all relative, right? Like I would find success with an artist dropping 50 NFTs and we give those 50 people the coolest experience ever. Right. Like I also find success with the day where we can sell a hundred thousand NFTs for $5. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it, it's interesting because I was having a conversation about the way that Asia as a whole and specifically Korea looks at music compared to the U S and the U S is very, very, very much about art. We're very art forward in the terms of like a musician and, and like obviously people are going to be like, well, no, this music, there's examples, right. Of like in pop or right. But in Asia, um, and this specifically again, I say in Korea, the, the way that you've seen like these K-pop acts and then this is happening a lot in Japan right now, there's like an, 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 an immersion of like these different, the very similar acts in, in, in Japan, they, they create the fan experience before they create the art. Right. And some people might look at that and be like, well, fuck that. It's music. Right. Like it should be in art first. And I, myself as like someone who's like a music nerd, I agree with that approach, but that's my, like what I like. Right. They are very amazing at creating this insane fan experience. And that's why you see these like BTS, their fans are insane because the experience was created to, considering the fan at such a high level that you know the level of discovery was calculated in a much more attractive way for them right and then they slap on the art that's like this is cool right and then i'm gonna go back to food as the last thing and i've always told people this they're like you know why do you think your restaurants are so successful like was your food that good and i was like i think my food was good it's not gonna change your fucking life you know i mean when i did my first restaurant was breakfast for dinner it was about that what you created contextually around the food, like what you made, you know, how you made people feel there, right? Like ultimately, when you go to your favorite restaurant, most of the time it's like, you know, for a bowl of pasta, whatever it is, it's good. It's good enough. It, it tastes good. But we're not talking about the world's most complex way of making a noodle and whatever it is. Like usually people like, going to something that's more comforting. That's why we like fast food, right? That's why people like their childhood favorites. It's not nothing complicated. Yeah. So in that regard here, I think that approach that I was saying, like that I was talking about the people that do up artists in Korea, like that's really interesting to me because it's very similar. And I think with web three, you have the ability to do all that. We have seen the most successful projects in NFTs, not necessarily, not necessarily have the craziest art. There's a reason for that. The art is just like the cherry on top, the connector, whatever it is. No one looks at a bored ape comparing it to a Michelangelo painting. And that's that. And there's no reason to even compare those two, right? There's no point because they're different. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, I, as you said that, I was just thinking about uh, the, the bored ape listeners of the podcast coming at us in the comments. I, I had an ape. I had a mutant at one point. And when I had my mutant, I, I really looked at it for a long time. And I was like, trying to convince myself that this is art, you know, like, I like this. And eventually it grew on me. But you're totally right. You can't compare them. The the visual representation was the additional layer on top of the experience that I was involved in. Um, so appreciate that breakdown there. I'd like to, First. I'd like to dive into a couple quick this or that type questions, and then do my one, two, web three, which I do with every guest. Uh, you go with that? Of course. All right. So I see, I see you, uh, you're, you're a fan of rap music. So am I. So I got a question for you. Her loss or heroes and villains? Dude, that is fucking an amazing question. I'm actually really, <laughs> really glad you asked that one too. Um, first of all, I've been, I've been making everyone listen to heroes and villains. That is that fucking album is a masterpiece. Um, I'm a big Metro Boomin fan, so I would say I would say Heroes and Villains for All sure. Right. But I'm, I'm glad that you're that you even know that. Her loss is is cool. 
Uh, I this is that comes to a big shock to people, but I'm actually not the biggest Drake fan. But I love mm. Twenty One Savage. Gotcha. Yeah, I. For me, it's her loss, but I think I need to give Heroes and Villains another listen. So um, you, you, you I, got you, to play it in order. Okay, play it in That's order. That's the thing. That's the thing. I I played it in order, and I was like, "Fuck, this is like a really nice, just like story." Is how it feels. Okay, I'll, I'll give that another try. But uh, second question: custom contract or music NFT marketplace drop? Say it one more time. Custom, like, should an artist do a custom contract? Or a music NFT marketplace NFT drop, you know, like hmm. sound or catalog. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. I would say that if they do a marketplace, it shouldn't be a music marketplace. I think that's where it becomes interesting. Is let's see music drop on OpenSea or Magic Eden or Coinbase or I mean, I guess we did that. <laughs> that we actually did that with Coinbase. But like, I I like I like when things go in places they don't they wouldn't normally, right? So like. It really depends. I think if you can get that like SoundCloud kid to just do it on their own custom contract, like that's just fucking cool from like a culture standpoint. Um, I think if you're trying to onboard people and like you use you have the leverage of a big name, like if one of the world's biggest artists wanted to drop today, um, and they use Coinbase, that would be awesome because it would probably get a lot of people to feel comfortable and everything. Yep. Music NFT or music video NFT. Music video NFT. I, I actually think that playing music NFTs just for music are cool, but as people like us who are music nerds, like I don't see myself like in the car fucking trying to like pull out my MetaMask to play a song. Yeah. All right. Then last question here before we dive into our one, two, web three. Collectible or utility? Collectible. All right. Appreciate those answers. So the one, two, web three, my first question for you here is, Who's an influential Web3 creator, entrepreneur, or collector that's really inspired or educated you? That's a good one. What I will I will say is, you know how, I, and you'll get this as a, as a rap person, but you know like that rolling loud, crazy, like that when you go and like you feel that culture, those artists that are, again, like not, they're not the biggest ones, like the, like a Don Tolliver or Shaq West or like yeah. those kinds of people. The closest I've seen to that was D-Gods. Okay. That was the closest thing I saw to D Gods. And what I think D Gods did really well is that they made it feel bigger than you. And I don't own one. I don't own one. I actually don't own a Utes either. But the way they did is such a good job where it felt like it was bigger than you. It felt like you were subscribing to something more than a project. And I think they did a really good job on that. And that's what I, I see a lot in that, that like underground hip hop culture. Yep. Uh, second question for you is favorite NFT. What's yours? Hmm. That's a hard one, man. It is a hard one. Um, that's really hard. You know what? Punks. Punks. Do you because have you one know yourself? What? I don't. But I was going to say, I'm going to only name, first of all, I'm only going to name something I don't own because you know if motherfuckers are come after me, I think I'm trying to pump it. And second of all, I think what I like about punks is they're un unapologetically themselves. They don't do shit and they're the OGs and they're just fucking sick and they don't have to do anything. And I'm glad that punks, and I'm glad that you got has managed to keep that and it didn't come out as like now you can fucking you can like walk to the punks lounge at lax like that's not that's i'm glad it didn't go that route i'm glad they're just what they are yep last question for you in five years what's the craziest thing you you think we'll be doing in the metaverse that people just aren't thinking about yet <laughs> start actually using it <laughs> i mean in the meta i you know i I've been wondering if people are going to start having dinner in the metaverse and not actually consuming the food. I've been curious to see if that's going to be something. What I think will be something is like vacations in the metaverse. Like you're literally on it for like three days and you're staying on a resort, but like not like you take it off and put it on and it's like a, a background, but like you're going on like actual trips. Mm, that's cool. Yeah, definitely haven't heard that one on the pod. So I like the take. Um, well, Jeremy, this has been this has been a good convo. I, I really appreciate you diving into the world of music with me, talking about everything culture. And we even got a lot of food and hip hop stuff mixed in. So that's always fun. Can you let us know after listening to the pod, where can we connect with you, find the work you're doing in the Web3 space? Uh, yeah, at Jeremy Fall on all platforms or JeremyFall.com. Everything's in my name. Amazing. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening to the Unstoppable Podcast. We're putting out episodes every single week on Tuesdays. So with that, I'll catch you next week with another episode of the pod. Thanks for listening.
Thank you so much.